lately, as you likely know, I've been talking about things again that I wish people would have told me. And back in December, just off the top of my head, these are some of the things that I wrote down, about 20 of them. And we've been adding to them and covering some of those since. So let me follow up on that. And then we're going to hop to the live charts, crypto first, and then we'll get stocks. So the battle is within. And I had no idea how hard the psychology was and how important the psychology was when I first got started. And even yesterday, you know, I, I get reminded of how hard the psychology is and a little bit today, you know? So anyway, uh, Livermore once said, speculators' chief enemies are always boring from within. And I went back and looked, I did a, a series on Livermore probably about, oh, I don't know how many, maybe 10 or 15, based on mostly on reminiscence of a stock operator. And I started pulling from that tonight a little bit. And I'm like, geez, I better watch it before this whole thing becomes a, a Livermore uh, speech. But the bottom line is I wanted to talk a little bit about psychology. And I talk so much about psychology, this would take hours to cover everything I would like to cover. So I just want to scratch the surface a little bit to kind of remind everyone, especially if they're newer to trading, how hard the psychological part would be. So one thing is the map is not the territory. You'll find that out really quick. It's easy to say, hey, do this and do that, okay? Here's the Landry Light pullback. Here's the parameters, go out and do that. It's a lot harder to actually do that. Now, here's an example I used in yesterday's Your Daily Five, which is on Stock Charts TV. And these zones in here, these are the TFM 10% zones and 10%, once the market's 10% or more, away from the 50-week closing high and closes below the 50-week moving average, you get out and you get back in or you buy when you have two bars of land you like, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average and you're within 10% of the 50-week closing high. So I did the back testing, like I said yesterday, in the your daily five. And it looked pretty good in the queues too. I started off with um, the P's and the system is based on the S&P 500. But again, it worked pretty good or pretty well in the queue. So just for SGs, I bought 100 shares and I'm not a systems trader, although I've developed probably thousands of systems. It's probably not as many as it sounds, but uh, because a lot of these systems might be variations of, of each other. And then in more recent years, I've simplified things way down. And that's why I like something like this, this crazy little system, it actually works good. It's, it's crazy simple. But anyway, the buy was there. And just for SGs, it's like, well, let me just buy 100 shares. Who cares, right? Well, that has begun to add up. And, and knock on wood, it's probably about $600 more today. I think the queues were up six or seven points earlier. And they're just shy of all-time highs. And it's been fairly hard, I, I have to admit, just to just to sit on my hands, especially like right here. This was a pretty serious drawdown. And then I was looking at the stop just yesterday when I did your daily five. And that's 45 plus another 25 points. So that's like almost 70 points I'd have to give up. That's like $7,000. And it's like, well, that's starting to add up a little bit. And that's going to be hard to ride out. But because I've, I said I would, I would do it. I'm going to see if I could continue to follow the system. And believe me, when it's going to be, when it drops 10 or 15 points or 20 points, it's going to be hard to, to ride it out. So the map is not the territory. Now I didn't want to get again too far into Livermore, but I, I had to throw this one in here. A man may see straighted clearly and yet become impatient or doubtful when the market takes its time about doing what it, doing as he figured it must do. And I thought a good example for this would be the KNF, which is in the live portfolio. So it triggered way back last July, and then it went sideways for weeks and weeks. Now that doesn't look like much in this chart. It's like, oh, Dave, it just went sideways that long. 
You sit there day after day after day after day after day and watch this thing go up and mostly down and mostly sideways. It's very hard to hold on. And you begin to think, well, that's dead money. And dead money is money that has little or no chances of ever making you any money. Well, you don't know that it's dead money at the time. And then look what it did. One, two, three, over three months where it went mostly sideways again. Very hard to hold through those ups and downs, but the stop wasn't hit. So what do you do? You just hang on. Now, I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully a year from now, we'll be looking at this. And if you go back and look at some of those huge winners that we've held a couple of years, there's not that many of them. But if you go back and look at them, you don't really see all these times, weeks, and sometimes months where they go sideways. But we've already shifted gears into that longer term trend following mode, and there's nothing to do. But most people, have a hard, hard time just sitting there and waiting and just letting everything unfold. And that's a that's one I probably need to add. I know I talk about it so much, but I probably need to add patience and how much of it you're going to need to trade to my list of things I wish I knew. But you can see, you just look at this chart. Oh, yeah, Dave just went straight up. It's like, well, a lot of sideways motion in there too and a lot harder to sit through that. So the map, again, is not the territory. One thing that's kind of hard to wrap your head around is that you'll feel like Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcomes sometimes. And you'll feel like that, especially when you take several losses in a row, and then you're faced with the next trade that you must pay. And that gets really, really hard because you're lose, 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 lose. And then you're like, I can't take this trade. I've been losing too much. And then bam, that one trade would have made your year and that's the tough part that's a hard part about trend following i don't i don't want to come up here and, and and act like trend following is easy it's the hardest or one of the hardest ways to make money in the market but guess what it's the only way to make money in the market because you're going to have to capture a trend if you're ever going to make any money in the market now here's one of those paradoxes i was talking about there will be times where you must look deep within yourself to make sure you have not become the definition of insanity. So Churchill once said, you, you go from, uh, what is it? Uh, in, uh, success is going from one failure to another without any loss of enthusiasm. Well, that's not too easy. And you also, again, paradoxically, have to make sure you have not become Einstein's definition of insanity. You might hit upon something that's working really well, and then all of a sudden it stops working. It's like, uh, but it was working so well. I think those are the six words. Those are the six most dangerous words on Wall Street. Now, here's the thing. When you're trading, it feels good to win, doesn't it? Yeah, it feels good. But what they don't tell you is losses feel really, really, really bad. And the other thing they'll tell you, and it's a slide and trading full circle, and I can maybe dig it out for next week, but most of your time is spent in a drawdown. And the reason your losses feel so bad is because from a neurological standpoint, when you lose, it has twice the emotional impact. And I think one of you guys said more like five, okay? Five times the emotional impact of a, a good feeling, okay, when you lose. And that's that sort of leads you to gambler's ruin or could, could lead you to gambler's ruin. And... The casinos know this all too well. They know if you make some money, you can feel good you made some money. But when you lose money, you feel like you got to keep losing money to try to get it back. It should feel so bad. You, you end up chasing that high, so to speak. Now, one thing that was a bit of an epiphany for me, and I think it was about 15 years ago, is when I realized how much neurology is involved. And that was a little neurology I just talked about. Because from a neurological standpoint, you feel good about something good, but you feel really bad about something bad. And from a neurological standpoint, you cannot eliminate your emotions. And this was a based on a speech I, I saw from Denise Shaw, and she pulls a lot of information from Descartes. Uh, I think it's, uh, or is it Damasio? Descartes' era, I think, is the book. It's not the most exciting book in the world, but it does help you to wrap your head around the fact that you can't make decisions without emotions. So seeing your picture in the dictionary is a bad thing. 
You talk about the definition of insanity. Uh, extraneous influences abound. And this is another thing I've been working on a lot and, and probably preaching a lot about too. You have so many extraneous influences when it comes to trading. Like I said last week, my wife had an injury about six weeks ago and it kind of threw everything kind of into, it kind of confused everything and, and um, a lot of stuff happening. And it, it, it affected my trading. It had to. You know, anything that's happening in your home life will affect your, your trading life. And there's so many extraneous influences. And then, as I've said a thousand times, I learned that something as simple as me being sugar low can affect my trading. And I, I call it the walk in the office trade. And I later realized. That's all based, and I know I've been saying this a lot, so I'm, I'm sick of hearing it myself, but it's based on the hangry judge effect. I think Dan Arley uh, was the one that talked about that. 